And for more, we're joined by François Isbourg. He's chair of the International uh, Institute of Strategic Studies. Uh, your latest book is called Lessons of a War, and it is this war, yes, thank you for showing the book, uh, that we are talking about. Uh, it's, uh, it's still beggar's belief that he... Here we are talking about a conventional war in Europe in 2023. Uh, a, a year of Europe's worst war since 1945. Worse than Yugoslavia. Oh, yeah, much worse. Uh, uh, whatever your metrics are uh, in terms of the number of soldiers committed, in terms of the number of civilians at risk, uh, in terms of the size of the territory involved, uh, in terms of the nature of the forces involved, this, these are the regular armed forces uh, of uh, established states. Uh, uh, there are, of course, some rogue elements like Wagner uh, and the like. But still, this is an interstate conflict uh, reminiscent of the earlier parts of the 20th century, uh, not the wars of the non-state actors that we had in, the, in parts of the Middle East or in the Balkans after the Cold War ended. Uh, so yes, this is, this is very different, and it's bigger, and it's worse, and the consequences are substantially higher, the stakes are higher than they were, uh, than they were in the Balkans. So let me just get you to react to, and I'll give a recap of what our correspondent just said, Gulliver Craig. The Ukrainians now considering holding uh, Bakhmut, unsure whether or not uh, that's doable, but that's what, uh, that's what the chiefs of staff are advising the president. And those ordinary soldiers that he's been speaking to in Kramatorsk, coming back from the front, saying, well, we'd like to keep on going. Now, uh, is it a question if the Ukrainians are confident that they're degrading, as it were, uh, inflicting more casualties on the Russians than they're sustaining... Uh, themselves. Is that a good news story or a bad news story? If one looks to the very recent past, it's a good story because that's actually what happened. That is, the Russians were losing hundreds of soldiers a day uh, from Ukrainian uh, fighting. Uh, uh, the balance of casualties was clearly in Ukraine's favor. Uh, I must say I'm worried about the announcement uh, made uh, from Ukraine uh, today. Maybe they have data and information, which I don't have, and, 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 the, and they are obviously the ones who have to make the decision. But uh, the tactical situation in and around Bakhmut makes it now much more difficult for the Ukrainians to bring in ammunition, uh, ment maintain the logistical uh, pipeline, as it were, uh, to the Ukrainian forces fighting in the center of Bakhmut against the Russians who are surrounding them on three, three out of four sides. Uh, so yeah, Gulliver saying they're going to have to win back at least one of those main asphalt roads into town. They need us. They need they need a road. They need a bridge, uh, and that is what they don't have for the uh, for the time being. So I'm. Uh, I'm simply hoping that the military advice is good and that the politicians will make the right decision. Russia's nuclear armed power, uh, if they suffer defeat after defeat or if they do get degraded further, uh, should we worry about how they'll respond or should, uh, or, or is that something that we have to put aside? Well, when, when nuclear weapons are present in any conflict, you worry about them. Uh, otherwise, you're not being professional. It's like a doctor who wouldn't worry uh, uh, about germs. Of course, he's going to worry about germs. Uh, but uh, uh, Russian nuclear doctrine uh, is quite conservative, and there is, to my knowledge, no indication that the Russians have been acting or indeed speaking outside of their own uh, doctrinal framework as it has been displayed for the last few years. Uh, you don't use nuclear weapons for trivial reasons. Uh, if you lose a town or a city in part of Ukraine, uh, that does not justify, in the eyes of Russian doctrine, that you put the whole of Russia at risk of a nuclear war, which means the death of dozens of millions of Russians. Uh, there is an imbalance of uh, stakes 
uh, involved, uh, which means that people like myself, uh, analysts who follow the conflict uh, and who are old enough, as is unfortunately my case, uh, to have known uh, some of the episodes of the Cold War, uh, my worries about the, the nuclear aspects here have been real, but they have been measured. Uh, we haven't, for the time being, witnessed a moment similar to the Berlin crises of the late 50s and early 60s or of the Cuban Missile Crisis. We're not at that point we yet. Are not, we are not at that point. And, uh, you know, given the way the conflict is unfolding, which, I mean, which is essentially within the borders of Ukraine, uh, I would find it very bizarre for the Russians to actually move that conflict to Russia by using nuclear weapons, because that would get every single nuclear power involved. China and India have already made it very clear that if Russia felt that it could use nukes, uh, that would be a very, very, very unfortunate of course, decision. There are, there are other scenarios. I mean, we talk about what constitutes a victory for Vladimir Putin. Obviously, uh, there's taking Kyiv, which looks much more unlikely than it did a year ago. Uh, but there's uh, there's also could be just simply, would, would it be a victory for Putin if he just lays to waste all of eastern Ukraine? That's something we have to fear. It's not simply the east of Ukraine. It's Ukraine as a whole. I mean, the, uh, uh, the Russians have free reign when it comes to bombing whatever target they choose in Ukraine with a limited exception and even that is questionable, which are the nuclear power plants uh, located in, in, in Ukraine. Other, 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 yeah, otherwise, you've seen dozens of rockets fall on Kiev. You've seen dozens and of rockets fall every uh, Monday in October, November, in various cities of Ukraine. It was usually on Mondays. Uh, boom, many of these rockets have been shot down. The Russians have problems replenishing their stockpiles. Uh, so they've been holding back a little bit in recent weeks. But uh, you know, they, they can continue this for quite a long time. We're seeing images here uh, from earlier in the day. It was Russia's defense minister uh, who paid a visit to Mariupol. Uh, we haven't seen uh, Vladimir Putin on the front line ever since he made that visit to the Kerch Strait Bridge. Uh, that's as close as he got, I think. Yep. Um, uh, it, it, your, your reaction when you see Sergei Shoigu there? Uh, it's sufficiently rare to be noticed. And this is sort of bizarre because he is defense minister and Gerasimov, the chief of defense staff, to my understanding, has only been once, and he nearly lost his life, by the way, on that single visit he did, I think it was in uh, April or May of last year, uh, because the uh, Ukrainian targeting was quite good, and uh, they, they zapped uh, the area in which he passed, uh, missing him by a matter of minutes or hours. Uh, uh, it does tend to indicate that... Uh, the Russians are careful with their own lives, uh, if, if not those of their soldiers. It also means, and that's another take, uh, that they still see this as a special military operation rather than a full-blown war, which would call for the mobilization of the country as a whole and which would normally force the leadership to expose itself more than it has done until now. François Isbourg, the book is called the Les Leçons d'une Guerre, The Lessons of a War. It's published in French. Thank you for being with us here. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.